host Jimmy Adcock and for 10 years I was the GPR specialist in John Gator's GeoPhys team. Right, I've been asked to do like a 15 minute masterclass on ground penetrating radar, GPR. Anyone who is ever unfortunate enough to be on the receiving end of one of my anecdotes in the pub will know that me only talking for 15 minutes is never going to happen. <laughs> I could make an idiot of myself here. Me and Henry riding a bronze dog on my first night on time team. And I've never felt so bad about anything I've ever done at work. If you find watching paint dry a little bit too exciting, you want to watch an egg cooking on a hypercourse floor. All I can say about that whole experience was you would not believe how much geophysics equipment you can cram into a Toyota Yaris. I'm just terrible in front of camera. In the end, a pair of grotty old trainers got more airtime than, uh, than I did. And I assumed that as soon as we'd finished that scene and we all walked away, he would realise that he had a pocket full of cheese. You know, if you're going to put a life-size bronze dog in a bar, someone is going to get on it. And I mean, judging by the pattern on that dog's head, I, I would suggest we weren't the first people to uh, Bronco Billy that particular statue. <laughs> you need more than three days, basically. <laughs> I'll keep this as short as I can. So let's just dive straight in. What is ground penetrating radar? Well, uh, radar stands for radio detection and ranging. So we are using radio waves to locate objects and layers in the ground beneath our feet and determine how deep they might lie. Uh, all GPR systems work in roughly the same way. That is that you have a transmitter and a receiver. Transmitter is just constantly firing out pulses of radio waves thousands of times a second. And those radio waves travel through the ground until they reach some kind of interface. So where you have two materials that have different electromagnetic properties. So the bigger the difference between the materials, the more energy we get reflected. In real life, it would look like this, where we have a transmitter, which is the TX, and a receiver, RX. And the transmitter sends out one of these pulses, and it starts spreading out pretty much in all directions. And if we drag a GPR across the site or drive it across the site, whatever we might do, and collect hundreds of those traces all next to each other, we can build up a picture of the subsurface. And so this is a radar gram, and it's a vertical slice into the ground. It's kind of like what physics would see the sidewall of a, of a trench as. Now, that's great if you want to look at the profile of a ditch, work out exactly where a wall line is or the depth to a floor surface. But if you've got a fairly complex archaeological site, you're probably more interested in how it's laid out to be able to see the reflection strength in a kind of horizontal map at different depths. So we want to go from having these single profiles to a cube of data that we can slice or do other stuff with. And here you can see we've got a radar gram, except the difference now is that it's not just one radar gram, this is a 3D cube of data. So if I turn it around, we can see a bunch of individual profiles. And what we're doing is we're effectively building a loaf of bread out of the individual slices. One thing that we could do is we could um, actually just strip out the quiet stuff. So remove the areas where we don't have any reflections, just leave the strongest responses. And now if I spin it back up again, well, now we can start to see, yeah, there's definitely something building like in there. Let's this time look at some slices. And where you get the whites and the reds, those are going to be the strongest reflections. And we're gradually coming up towards the surface. And now those wall lines, those foundations and the, the bottom few courses of, of um, stonework are really clear to see. So if I just bring that back and change to what we call an ISO surface, this is saying to the software, what I want you to do is I just want you to remove all of the quiet stuff and just plot the cells that have the strongest reflectors. And then we get a real impression of where the resources are. These archaeological resources sit within the volume of data that we've collected. OK, let's then have a look at where we've used this on Time Team. And I've just picked a few which stand out in my mind as having been um, really good or were kind of the first time we actually managed to make something work well. And so the first one I remember having these really nice, clear time slices was Binchester up in County Durham, Roman settlement grown up along the side of a road. And the, the mag data from there showed these very clear square building footprints, which we thought were um, mausoleum structures. 
So we did a very small GPR survey over a set of these. And this animation is going to show you slices starting at the surface, getting deeper and deeper and deeper. It's going to get to the bottom and then it's going to come back up and stop sort of halfway through the archaeology. So let's just watch it. First thing we saw was some ploughing marks. Then we see the remains of the, the buildings. And then we go beneath the buildings back into natural material right at the bottom. And now we're going to come back up again. And if I stop it just here somewhere, there we go. What we can see is we have the boundary wall for the, this particular mausoleum, the mausoleum structure itself, and then outside a smaller structure that would have had a small tree planted inside it. And then there's another one next to it and a third one just disappearing out of the survey area. And we've got some really nice details. So like this fishtail shape is actually where demolition material, the, the thing has started to collapse and the material's fallen into the ditch next to it. So these diagonals were hints of the, the roadside ditch. And uh, this was also the first time I ever managed to make this isosurface effect work. And I mean, this was, when was this, 2007, 2008, something like that. It took me so long to make this because computing power wasn't what it is now that it never made it to air. I mean, it probably wouldn't have made it to air because for some reason I've made it snot green. I have no idea why I decided that would be a good idea. But what these ISO surfaces can really do is show you how the individual elements of a site sit within, you know, the the um, within the stratigraphy. You know, what's higher than what? So you could see that the fish tail of material had slumped down into uh, a ditch, whereas that wouldn't necessarily be obvious from just a single time slice. And just to prove that, uh, you know, it really does work, uh, this black line on this time slice is the outline of this trench. And we can see that there's a really good correlation between the features in the radar grams, uh, in the time slices from the radar and the stuff that was sat in the ground. So there's your doorway and there's your doorway there. Next one that worked really well, and we actually got the images out into the program, was uh, Care Went in South Wales. So there we had a Roman, again, Roman town, um, really obvious building in the uh, magnetic data, but even more obvious in the GPR. So this is like composite looking at um, sort of, I don't know, maybe 75 centimetres of stratigraphy. And then these are individual slices, maybe 10 centimetres thick. Uh, going through that sort of 75 centimeter block. And again, you know, there was a really good correlation between what came out of the trenches and what we were seeing in the GPR data. And so that was another one where we managed to make a, a volume that we could then manipulate and spin around. And I mean, compared to the time it would take to do it now, you know, this was a quite a bit of effort back then, but uh, now it'd be very, very simple to do. Uh, another one was Radcott in Oxfordshire. I think it was Stephen and Matilda, I think Castle related to them. And so this is the time slice showing the footprint. But the question here was, um, how big was the central pillar underneath this tower? It was supposed to give us an idea then possibly of how tall the thing might have been. You know, what kind of floor would it have supported? And so we were really interested in this central core now, the vertical scale is exaggerated here to make it more obvious, but it we could see that that central pillar had similar foundation depth as the walls all the way around it. So it was probably something pretty substantial above that. And again, you know, good correlation between what we saw in the trenches and uh, what was in the GPR data. As an aside, that was also the site where um, Matt Williams and uh, discovered that you should never turn your back on a digger driver. Can't be trusted. Can't be trusted. Um, ultimately, where things have gone is that processing power has become much better with GPR. So um, we can process data quicker. We can process bigger data sets than we could before. And in terms of hardware, what we're doing now is all of those previous data sets, they were collected with a single antenna. So every time you push the machine up, you collect one line of data. And so you have to do a lot of legwork to cover the big areas. Now, however, we have systems where we have lots and lots of receivers and lots and lots of transmitters all built into a single box. 
They're really close together. So it means that we can collect lots and lots of data at a density we could never have dreamed of before. And that produces incredibly high detail. Now, we were really lucky to be given one of these systems on the last series of Time Team that we did. And um, Brancaster was where it really came into its own. So having this level of detail and also the speed of data collection meant that we could get a really big chunk through the middle of that, that Roman town um, really, really quickly. And we can see detail in here, like uh, the buttresses on the side of buildings, uh, pillar bases where they're built to, to hold the floor above up, um, cross flue hypercourse, just so much detail that we would have had to work really hard with the single channel instruments to be able to achieve. So if we have a look at the little animation, uh, we can see, you know, these floor surfaces where you get the rectangular regions of strong reflection. Um, then we get the more uh, clear building outlines. Uh, though those are the buttresses that we talked about, uh, the cross flue hype course. And then as you get deeper, you start to see which of the buildings would have had um, the deepest foundations. We don't have any topography in play here. This is Norfolk. It's flat as a pancake. So that kind of suggests that these buildings had the deepest foundations. And so, you know, possibly that was some kind of uh, bathhouse, uh, which had, you know, required deeper walls, deeper foundations. And then this was the Principia down here. And so we think that this was uh, the kind of strong room, like a cellar. And that was where Phil ended up spending most of his days um, digging that one out. So really fantastic detail. And Brancaster is one that I would love to go back to and actually just survey the rest of that field. So that's it. That's the, the masterclass. How long have I taken? God, I don't know. Uh, 20 minutes. That's not so bad, is it? I mean, for me, that's, that's, that's like lightning. Um, hope you found that interesting. And uh, if you do have any questions, you can always post them in the comments and hopefully they'll get back to me and uh, I can answer them for you. Any site where at the end of the three days, Mick walks up to you and goes, yeah, did good there, well done. Those were the good sites, those were the good ones. To ensure you catch all the latest updates, please do subscribe to this channel, follow us on social media, sign up to our newsletter and join us on Patreon.